stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in all and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes an orphan a son and daughter The King of glory The King of glory Who makes the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace That's how we should all be responding right there. That was perfect. Welcome to worship here at Midland this morning. So glad you made it out. Um, this is a, a fun time of getting together here. Summer is wrapping up for some. We are all sweating together. That's uh, welcome to the South in August. 
Um, but we had some just amazing stuff happening at the church yesterday. We have the market each Saturday from May through October. We had some incredible work happening out back here, which hurt my heart a little bit because they took third base up back in the day. We played kickball, and third base was that you know part of the retaining wall. But it looks absolutely amazing. Um, Taylor. Uh, put this together. Legnetto is one of our youth here at the church and Eagle Scout project. She got all it together, had incredible workers out there yesterday, great volunteers from the troops, from the church, from friends and teachers. And so if you get a chance when you leave today, walk out that way and go take a look out there. It looks absolutely amazing. Really great work. Thanks to all who were here. When you came in, hopefully you got a bulletin in your hand, let you know some stuff happening here at Midland. An amazing QR code that we just got set up uh, to launch last week, so it's new. If you find anything wrong with it, just tell us you don't know what you're doing here. Let me fix it for you, and we'll take your advice, okay? Um, but it's an incredible way just to connect here at Midland. If it's your first time, special welcome to you. Um, you'll find a way there when you scan that code to check into our system and establish your name. And you can give us whatever information you want to share, and whatever you don't, you can keep it to yourself. Um, but it's just one of our ways of connecting with the folks throughout our community. And we're so grateful for a chance to connect with you. Uh, take a moment this morning, look at the folks around you, shake a hand, give a hug, and tell them good morning.
You can be seated. Each week uh, during this time in the service, we take just a moment to, uh, to kind of quiet down a little bit. Now, for everybody out there, some of you need a little bit of a nap maybe, and this is a great time to, to pray and to sleep. Um, and then we'll wake you back up, but um, you can get a little rest in there. But it's a time when we take just to really be still for a moment. Uh, there'll be a little bit of music. We'll pass the offering plates around for you to drop connection cards and offering this morning. But it's also a time for you just to bring some things before God. Uh, maybe it's the stuff sitting on your heart. Um, maybe it's the stuff that uh, you realize good and well. There's not much you can do about it, but something's got to be done about it. And you've got to be willing to open up those hands and trust God to work in the midst of it. And for some of us, it's just a time to say thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's pray. Guys, we come in here this morning and we come with an expectation. God, whether it be a big expectation or a small expectation, it's to see you do amazing things or just to make it through another time at church. God, we pray that you bless these moments. God, the conversations that take place. God, words that are spoken. God, those folks we get a chance to sit next to, to be reminded that we're not in life alone, that God, you're with us and you are at work. And that's a great thing. So God, we pray that you bless these moments, this time together. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And have the ushers pass the plates this morning. Amazing. All right, don't do that for me, okay, girl? That's okay. All right, ready? One, two, three. That's pretty good. Some of y'all are more awake than others. You had a neat... Yeah, we had a special donation. Some of y'all have gotten to experience. Someone made a huge donation to um, give you guys some doodling tablets so that you would not draw on the envelopes for us. Um, so thank you to that family. <laughs> they may have said it was their child that was drawing on the envelopes, and that's why they recommended them. So we met a new friend last week. Who remembers what our friend's name is? Teeny? Tina. Tina. Is it? All, all I remember is that she was a termite or an ant. She's a termite. She's a teeny tiny termite, right? But we also met a new friend in the Bible who remembers his name? Moses. Moses. And Moses was a a baby in a basket. A baby in a basket. Well, Moses is an adult in today's story because that's how it works is we just kind of fast forward. I know this part. You know this part. What happens next? So Moses gets a stick from God that when he throws it on the floor, it turns into a snake. And then the other people say, that's She fast forwarded and skipped the part of the story for today. <laughs> Before we get to Moses' really cool snake, Miss Annalie, come here, friend. Hi. 
Come here. <laughs> come here. Hi. Come here. Yeah, you can't just wander back to the drums. Hold on, guys. Yes. And you have a brother named Max. Well, we're going to talk about a bush that caught on fire. How do y'all feel? Because of God. What else? And it didn't burn. That's right. That's a super important part. So, and he was talking in the flames. And one of the things that we know is that if God takes care of really cool things like teeny tiny termites named Tina, that he also takes care of us. Yeah. He kissed you, and the termite kissed um, Annalie. So we're going to say a prayer, and we're going to take this crew with us if you all haven't enjoyed this entertainment yet. You want, yeah? All right, let's put our hands together. Can you do that? Mm-hmm. Okay, where are you going? You make me nervous up here. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Help me to remember that you are good, and you take care of me. Amen. All right, friends, off we go. Go back here. We, yeah, that's what scares me. <laughs> Come on, we. You see, earlier when I said if you need a time to rest, you could take a nap. It's not that you had to wake up because you got to hear me preach. It's because I knew you wouldn't be able to sleep through what was going to happen afterwards. See? How many of y'all are feeling exhausted for our awesome volunteers already? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool thing. Um, if you haven't heard it before around here at Midland, what we say is we celebrate the chaos. Um, and that is having kids in worship with us. Um, we, uh, we try our best and we plan to, as long as we can, to have kids as a part of the service. Um, and so you get a chance to worship together as a family because we think here at Midland that's really important because we consider ourselves a family and so we want families together for worship. Even though we have pew hoppers, right? And even though we have the spirit moved and they run the aisles at times, and even though they speak in tongues in words that no one can interpret, all right, we still, we celebrate it um, here at Midland. There's something about um, having the kids with us that really is an important part of who we are as a church here. And we are so grateful to our volunteers. If you're looking for an opportunity and you want to get involved with children's ministry here, you are more than welcome to step up and join up with uh, the work we do and with the kids here at Midland. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a little bit loud sometimes. Um, but uh, really cool stuff we get to do. We're in a series looking at this idea of who we are as a congregation here at Midland. If you've been around for a little while, we do this um, every few years. Uh, We are Midland series, and this year we are uh, taking the time to look at uh, some of just the main parts of how we understand church here at Midland, give everyone hopefully a chance to either have a refresher on how we look at church, and a lot of folks a chance to hear for the first time, like, how does the thinking work around here at Midland, and what are we really about, and what does it mean when we say we're a family here at Midland? So that's kind of how this is going, and uh, hopefully it'll be fun uh, for everybody over these next two weeks after this is what we have left for the series. Last week when we got it all started, Um, We were just looking at some of our story, and this week it's going to lead into a little bit more. And I wanted to ask you as as we get started, before we kind of review a little bit of what we talked about last week, is uh, what uh, what is your story? What is your story? If you're going to tell your story, what parts are you going to tell? If you're going to tell your story, what parts are you going to leave out, right? Uh, If you're going to look back on your story, where do you really want to start? And uh, what do you want to see that story leading into in these upcoming days? It's crazy. In our culture we live in today, uh, we really have uh, all around us a culture that is more than willing to write our story for us. Have y'all noticed this? We have a culture all around us that's more than willing to write our story. They'll tell us who we are and what we will do and how we will do it and when we will do it. Have y'all noticed this at all yet? And here's the great part. Some people have no idea it's happening. You ever met them before and you're like, oh my gosh, do you know that the story is being written for you right now because you go by whatever so-and-so says. You ever met these people? Well, you know, I was listening to so-and-so the other day and they said, oh yeah, 
Absolutely. And they're writing your story for you. Your favorite news program writes it. Your late night talk show writes it for you. Um, and this is how it works. Whatever is on the magazines in the line as you wait at the store to check out, right? It's writing your story for you because you reach out and you see all these things and all that stuff becomes your stuff. Have you ever noticed this before? It's crazy how it works. Um, over and over again, you'll meet people this way. And the, the part that really gets me is we have filled schedules. Have you all noticed how many go, I'm a pretty busy person, right? I got a lot going on. I got a lot going on. And then you begin to look at your schedule. Like, how many of these things did I put on here? And how many of these things did somebody else put on here for me? Anybody with me on this one? Filled schedules, lots of stuff going on. And it's oftentimes, if you take a moment, you notice that uh, someone else is writing the story. And they're telling you how it's supposed to go. And these demands come on how it's going to be and the things you're going to buy and what kind of things they are and where you're going to buy them from. And you don't even know what's happening. Have you ever had this happen? You know what I'm talking about? How many of you are like, never happens to me, but I see it around me all the time? <laughs> Self-awareness matters. Self-awareness matters. All right, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. This is very interesting to me when we talk about stories. Same deal when it comes to the church. When you begin to look at the church, and we think that for some reason uh, the story is supposed to be about something different. But we live in a culture that's very good at writing the story for us as a congregation, for us as a church. We have a culture that's very good at telling me what I'm supposed to preach on, that's very good at telling me my stance on that and how I'm supposed to preach on it and what I'm supposed to say. Very good at it. If you haven't noticed, it's easy to fall victim to culture around us and then see churches deteriorate. Anybody seen this before? We let whatever's going on out there that's the big deal of the culture around us become our big deals. And whatever's being talked about there now has to be talked about on a Sunday morning. And whatever dividing over out there now has to be divisions within us as a congregation. And we let culture determine who we are. And I personally think this is kind of a big problem. I think there's another way it's supposed to work. In fact, I think the way it's supposed to go is as a people who gather, because we believe there's an amazing God doing amazing things, we are to influence culture. And we're supposed to give all the stuff around us a new story to tell. And so this morning what I want to do is take a look at that idea of the story that we have to tell. And to get it started, we went back to kind of catch you up last week. We, we talked about success as a church. Like, what is success for Midland or the fact that we have some people who are rather competitive like I am? Um, what's the win? What's the win? And, and the great part of it is I feel okay being a little competitive because Paul has a writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that's all about defining his words, the win. And so we talked this, about this, what is success for Midland? We, we saw these two core concepts that come up in Paul's writings to the church in Corinth, which is like Party City Church. Back in the day, it was the Las Vegas of the old days. It was a port city, the difference. It was on the water there, not in the desert. But people would come in, you'd bring in the cargo, you'd unload, spend the night, party hard, enjoy it, and then you'd head back out. Some people would stick around a little bit longer, and it became a very diverse community with people from all over the place hanging out in Corinth. Paul goes there, a church gets started, and crazy enough, even back in the old days, they had issues when they weren't the same, and the differences between them would come up, and they'd begin to fight. And so Paul writes a couple letters to them. We have two of them for sure. Some of us think there may be three contained within those two that we have in the Bible, and probably others that got written as well. But of the two that we have, First and Second Corinthians, in chapter 9 of First Corinthians, he lays out a great idea and understanding. And at the very beginning of all of this communication, he lays out a very good understanding. And here's how they look. Core concepts for us. To be all things to all people. He says, hey, we're going to be all things to all people so that some might be saved. And we said, and the deal is, the core concept is if we're going to do that, we have to be adaptable. If we're not adaptable, then we have no chance at being all things to all people, as Paul said. The problem came in is in the way that he started this letter. As he's writing to a very diverse community, the very first uh, chapter of this letter that we have today that we read starts off with a different core concept where he talks about the importance of being united in the same mind and the same purpose. And it's very interesting when you think about this idea of being united in the same mind and the same purpose, and at the same time also being all things to all people. And we said, so there's one core concept that's all about adaptability, and there's another core concept for us that's all about identity. 
To be united in the same mind and the same purpose requires identity. Knowing who you are and knowing who we are out here at Midland, which brought up the question that we ended with, how can a church be united in the same mind and the same purpose while being called to adapt? And I think that for us that comes about with our story, with the story of the congregation. You want to know who you are? Begin to tell the story. You want to know who you are? Begin to notice what parts of the story you love to tell and what parts you don't like to tell. That says a lot about who you are, doesn't it? There's a reason why there's some parts we want to leave out. Sometimes we just don't want to embarrass ourselves. Other parts is really because we're not proud of those moments, are we? Like, I don't want that to be my story, but I know it is. And so I'm living life now trying to make sure I don't have more stories like that. And then we have these other parts of our story that we love. How many of y'all have ever noticed that the parts of our story that we love most can sometimes change through the years? And suddenly that story that you never really thought about starts coming up more and more. Maybe it's when uh, you have your first kids and you have kids in your home now and you start thinking back to those times when you were a kid and when your little brother or little sister or big brother or big sister would do that and you start telling these stories. And at one point you're like, this is the most embarrassing thing ever. And now you're like, this is awesome. This one time when we were five and six, right? It wasn't me. He rubbed it on the wall. I would never do that, right? You remember these stories? And these stories come back around and they shape us. And I want to make the the argument today that the stories that we tell now begin to shape the stories that we write into the future. And that's what I want to take a little bit of a look at today. Now, there's a a way of looking at it, and I want to to show you something. When we begin to talk about, you know, what story we're writing, you can click it over one more time. You begin to think about it. This is one, one way of kind of processing this. This is not like the best way ever. But it's one way that I think can be kind of helpful for us over these upcoming weeks and as we just think about who we are as a congregation. So I'll move fast. This is the boring, like, you know, background of the whole thing. But an identity of who we are matters. Until we understand who we are as a congregation, we'll have a hard time ever getting it right. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's certain times when a business, uh, a person, a church uh, will have, there'll be something new constantly. You know, like, oh, yeah, 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 we, uh, we love blah, blah, blah. You know, we started this new service, and it's pretty awesome. You know, we got homemade breakfast every time, and then you realize that it takes a lot of work, and nobody wants to cook breakfast at your church. And so you're like, yeah, we hate doing that stuff. We're not cooks around here, but you know what we are? We are rock stars. And so we're going to have this awesome rock star service. You're all invited, you know, spike your hair and paint it different colors and show up, you know, and then you're like, nobody here actually knows how to play a guitar. We are not a rock star church around here, but what we are, you ever seen this happen before? If you haven't, you don't go to church enough, all right? Identity, who we are, who we are matters. And here's the other part. Who we are is a very hard thing to change. And the more you try to change it, the more unhealthy you will most likely be as a congregation. Now, there's this other part that builds on the idea of an identity, and that is a paradigm, a way of thinking and doing. And this is a really big deal. The way you think about and the way you do things as a church is bound to change through the years. It's hard to have a paradigm for ministry that can outlast everything else. Identity, it's a hard thing to change. Paradigm change is often required if you experience growth, if you experience craziness called COVID-19, right? The paradigm, the way we think and do has to shift now. Right? We don't have people gathering for however many months that was. We've got to find a new way to do church. We've got so many people showing up on a Sunday morning that uh, we're running out of space. The way we think and do is going to have to shift a little bit here or else we're going to suffer. Paradigm for ministry. And then the third part that kind of creates this nice little uh, you know, model for us is vision. This is the what could and should be. This is the place we often rush to. This is where most of the books are written. This is where people oftentimes, at least I'm, back in the day, this was nothing else besides this conversation for pastors. What's your vision? What's your vision statement? What's your vision? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Oh, man. God bless you. God bless you. It's like, oh my gosh, cut it out, guys. Like, what are we doing? Getting pastors together? Have you ever seen pastors get together and try to have conversation? Don't do it, all right? (laughs) Goodness, goodness. But these three things really matter. Who we are, which is hard to change. It really matters of knowing who you are. The way that we think and do, and what we believe could and should be in our future all begin to work together. And in the middle of that, here comes the culture. The culture of us as a congregation, the world we have created to live in. And these are the things that work together as we continue to write our story. 
And so I want to take a look at that this morning in this understanding. And to do that, I thought a good question to ask is, who are we? And to really set that up, I wanted to share something with you. To answer the question of who we are, if you've not been around Midland much, or, you know, I've been sticking around for a few weeks, a couple months, even a couple years maybe, I'm still trying to figure you all out around here. Um, this is a great Sunday because I'm going to show you a video that we put out back in 2016. In 2016 here at Midland, we celebrated 125 years as a congregation right here in this place. And so if you want to anytime, I'd love to take a crew. If you're interested, just tell me, Stefan, show me, and I will walk you up there. Our building upstairs is where our sanctuary is, built in 1891. There's a piece of that building. We had to do a pretty big renovation in it back in 2017, and we found the original outside of the building. It's still there. It had just gotten covered by some really cheap uh, wall stuff. It's not even sheetrock. I don't even know what you want to call that stuff. Really cheap something, all right? And we pulled that down and found there is still the original wood from the building in 1891, so it's still open. Framed it out. It's a pretty cool thing. But I want you to see a video. When we celebrated 125 years in 2016, we took time to sit down and just talk with some of the folks of the church. And um, this is kind of how it went. Well, my fondest memories of being at the church here is that I had both of my children still young. They were like eight and 10. My husband was a Methodist and I was Baptist, but we moved to his hometown. So I've been a Methodist ever since 1952. We had uh, a really welcoming church when we came here, so we never looked any further. I would say my fondest memory um, at Midland was probably the very first time we attended church. When we came in, everybody just made us feel very welcome. Um, it felt like a family. And throughout the service, I, you know, I just told myself, I, I knew we had found our church home. Yeah, we got connected really quick. It was, we walked in, people were right there with us. Hey, come see this, come see that. And then we also had lunch that day. That was a big thing. It was a big potluck lunch day. So and we didn't bring anything. We didn't bring anything. So they <laughs> said, hey, just come on in here. We've got you today. Don't worry about it. So we came on in and, and ate lunch and got connected with a whole bunch of different people. And there were some parents that had kids that were the same age as our kids. So it really helped us get connected really quick. Well, one of my funniest memories of the church we just, we had that privilege of getting to know some fantastic, lovable characters. And one of the characters was a man who supported this church, attended this church, who loved this church and the people of the church, but he was a character and his name was Arch Brown. And on fifth Sunday, if we had a fifth Sunday in a month, we had a night service here at Midland. And Arch was the usher that night. And so Arch was passing the offering plate up and down the pews. And he would pass it down and get it back. And he'd go, you tight wads. And then he'd pass it down to another pew. And he'd go, you skin flints. Arch was just like that. And uh, he did that from the front of the church to the back of the church, all the way to the back of the church. And then when it came time for him to take the offering plates back up to the altar, he got up to the altar and Holland took the offering plate. And he said, I have never had an usher to preach the sermon like you have tonight, Arch. So we're going to say the benediction. And that was it. I mean, church was over. But I mean, it was, that's one of the funniest um, memories that makes me think of how everyone just loved everyone and accepted everyone just like family. Church went through a lot of 
changes just before we did get married. I mean, they, the lighting, the, the carpet and everything else, painting, I mean, it was, it was wonderful that all that was done just before we got married. So, and of course, I guess the best thing was, uh, you know, when they, when they played the, uh, the music and mom came down and I saw her in her wedding gown for the first time. And uh, so that was obviously always a special moment for, for us. And It was a very special time, you know, to be married in the church I was raised in. I was born here. I think that my mother brought me here. I only weighed four pounds and five ounces going home, but I think my mother bundled me up and brought me the very next Sunday. That's just how my mom was, you know. Uh, if something was going on at church, we went. Music's always been a huge mm. part of our life here at the church. Uh, when we would come to choir, Miss Betty was there way back when, and people just don't realize how long she served us at this church. And I do want to take a second to remember the fact that she gave a lot of years, and she was a big part of, of this church and raising uh, the kids, uh, helping to raise the kids in this church and, and uh, keep them in line sometimes, give them, give them some strong, uh, motivation that sometimes they needed, <laughs> sometimes they needed. Um, my hopes and dreams for Midland are that it continues to grow and, you know, lives up to its philosophy of passionately growing to reach the community for Christ. I would love to see the children's classes grow and for my children to have a group of friends that they grow up together with. Um, I would love to see that families continue to come find a place, find themselves welcome, and the older generations of the church are still there to be our parents and grandparents and our village, which is what I see it as. My hopes and dreams for this church is to see the youth grow a little more. I mean, I had lifelong friends here at the church, and it has like evolved and grown like very much, and I'm very excited to see it grow and I love to have a huge youth group and maybe even work with a youth group. I'd like to see it still reaching out to the community. This is where all the growth is going to be in the county. Uh, there are several housing developments going in. Midland United Methodist is a, a, a natural central point for that and I think we can keep on growing with that. We, we have the second service is drawing in new people all the time. Uh, I'd love to see that keep going. I just know the future for this church is going well on its journey of being a good church to be a member of and to participate in. And with a young minister like we have now, uh, it can't do anything but go better, get better. Um, I would say more than anything, we're a family. And as soon as you walk through the doors, you are greeted. And it is just a, a family atmosphere at Midland and everyone is welcome. I, I think it's, it's just real. It's authentic. It's not, when you walk in, this is not fake. Uh, the smiles on people's faces, the, um, the different groups that people can get connected with, um, it's, it's real. It's who we are, um, and it's something that people can grab a hold of and can see that if we can develop those relationships here in the church, that's what it's all about. And I think that's what our strengths are here, is in the relationships that we can build with people who come. It's not necessarily about religion, it's about the relationships that we have with Christ. We have a sense of humor. We laugh together. We love together. We cry together. And we support. We are the embodiment, the physical being of God and His love for family. And I think in that way, we show the best, the best of Midland Methodist Church. So that was, what, where are we at now? Seven years, can I do math right? Seven years ago, almost to the date, it was back like in 
August and September, I think, as we were filming all that with an awesome guy named Nick Doss, who was a part of our church, and then got married a couple months later, and then a couple months later ended up moving, and we're like, Nick, you know, like, you did great work. Put all that together for us just to help us tell some of the stories. And we thought the best way to celebrate 125 years was just to tell some of the stories. Now, now how many of y'all knew some of this stuff about Midland United Methodist Church sitting out here? How many of you have seen it before? You're like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that stuff. Yeah. How many of you, the first time you're going, oh, so that's who these people are around here. Yeah. Here's the crazy part. If you go through and you look at that video, like I said, we're seven years uh, since that was put together. We have several of our families that are in there that are not here anymore. One of them, uh, who talked about raising her kids here, moved to Vermont. You know what I'm saying? And not only did she move to Vermont, she stayed there for a little while, and she came back to Savannah. She's still across the state. You know, I'm like, I thought you said you were staying around here. Right? I can name other people in those videos. I can tell you more stories about them and all the stuff that's happened, right? in their lives in the past seven years. I can also tell you that when we put this together, we weren't expecting that we were about to find out that the very floor you saw in the sanctuary where people were sitting on had lost all of the piers to hold it up, and it was just amazing that that building was still standing, right? We didn't know that was happening when we were filming that. It was the next year that we said we got to fix the ceiling tiles, and while we were fixing ceiling tiles, said we had to move all the pews out. Let's go and check the flooring and realize that we needed to fix the flooring, and then realize when we pulled the flooring up, it wasn't just the flooring, it was the subflooring and that stuff holding the building up. Had to have an engineer come in and then look at us and go, this is a miracle that your building is still standing. And we're like, okay, all right, yeah, that's good. He was like, I mean, I wouldn't put more than, he names a number, like, we had 120 here for Christmas Eve at one service. And there's like, oh, that's a bad idea. We're like, I know we've done it a lot of times though. And you look at the story that's being written. We had no idea that we were going to have that time that after we got the building looking so nice and much firmer now, you know, that we would also then not be able to meet in it anymore, right? And so you look at these things. If you know a little bit of the story, back in 2019, we came to a place where we're getting back to again now where it was hard to fit everybody at 9.30 and at 11 o'clock in here, and we started a third service. And that's why those lights are hanging in the back. You want to hear some more story? I could tell a story all day long. It was coffee house worship. And this room flipped that way. And then we had these amazing people that came to 830 service that flipped the room back around this way. So we had a service at 830 back there. And then we went upstairs and we did 930 traditional. And then we came back down here and we did 11 o'clock like it looks now. And people who came at 11 o'clock never knew that this didn't look anything like this two hours earlier. Right? And these are these stories that we tell about who we are at Midland and the ways that we can work together and the things that we see happening. And we're ho- our hope is that God is calling us to it and we are faithfully responding. And that's what we want to be because we want our story written in the way that God would have our story to be written. Now, I want to give you a little bit here to kind of an idea to look at this morning. And we're going to flip over to Luke chapter 5. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 5. If not, no worries. We're going to put it on the screen for you. Luke chapter 5, early on in Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke, he now comes up on a, a crew of folks that have gathered together and people are beginning to like to listen to him a little bit. And he comes up on some fishermen. And here's how the story goes. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. All right, so Jesus is teaching. People are liking this thing, so they're showing up. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So either there's too much pressure and people are crowding him, or he just needs a little bit of a distance. Jesus says, let me hop in your boat, and he lets him in. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, this is a great story. This guy shows up. His name's Jesus. He begins teaching. People love to hear what he has to say. Crowds are coming out. He's now hopped in your boat as you're trying to wrap up the morning. And uh, he uh, has been teaching from your boat. He's making your night when you fished all night long, last a little longer without any sleep. And then he looks at you and he says, hey, put out into deep water and uh, let down the nets for a catch. And and this is how Simon, also known as Peter, responds here. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Ever been there before? Been there, done that. We know what's out there and there ain't nothing out there today. This is the interesting part. It's like the big butt of the story. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. It's going like, really? 
Because you say, why, why do you care what this guy has to say? Is it because he attracts the crowd that you're like, oh, yeah, whatever you say, you get the crowds, we want the crowds. You know, like, we like this idea. We don't really know why exactly Simon, also known as Peter, agrees to do this. But for whatever reason, have you ever been so exhausted and so disheartened? You'll do anything anybody says. You're like, your idea is better than mine at this point, right? I don't know. Maybe that's where he's at. But because you say so. I'll let down the nets. And he does. And here's what happens. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. That's a big catch is all I'm saying. You know, that's nice. That's a good day on the job. Even if it was a long night, right? It's wrapping up nice. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Which is a very interesting one. You, you understand, we have our understanding of Lord here. Like, that's right. He is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord, right? But there's also this understanding back in the day that Lord was anybody above you, more power than you. This is like, part of me goes, Peter, are you going, I need to catch like this every night. And so I will call you whatever I can to win your favor. So you'll come back and tell me where to put out my net again, right? Lord was this idea of someone in charge above you. And so we don't know if he's identifying Jesus as, as we think of Lord or as just as someone. But he says, I'm a sinful man. I can't get anything right. Obviously, you know what? My life is going to... Everybody feel this way before? My life's awful. It's falling apart, but you make it better. All right? What in the world are you doing around here? Get away before the lightning strikes. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So this is a great story. This is really good. Jesus shows up and amazing things happen. And that preaches, by the way, that when Jesus shows up, amazing things happen. But, but I want you to hear what comes after this. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for who? People. Yeah, that's right. You're going to fish for people. And so... Since they get to fish for people, they pulled up their boats on shore and left everything. Left everything. Anybody up for that? Left everything and followed him. That's a shift right there. And what I love about this story that's so important for us to hear today, by the way, we're going to read it again next week. But for today, the part I want to look at is the part where he says, now you will fish for people. Did you notice Jesus doesn't come up to Peter after he hauls in this net and Peter's like, oh my gosh, I'm a sinful man, you know, and go, hey, bud. Put those nets up. You're going to be a preacher. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't do that. What does he say? Hey, we're going to go fish for people. One of the things that's so, so, so important, I think, to grab hold of with growth, the way we think and do has to change. The paradigm for ministry has to change. But who we are, who we are, our identity has got to stay the same. We can't somehow go, you know what? You know, Stephanie, you, you really, you, you remind me of Andy Stanley. Yeah. You know, like, you're so good. Like, thousands need to hear you. I know. I know. I get that part, you know. You don't have to tell me. I know. All right? And so we need to build this huge building, and it needs to hold at least 5,000 people in it. Um, because if we do, they'll be here. I mean, you just get up there and you just preach it. Like, this is not who we are, right? It's not who I am. As a congregation, when we gather together, what matters, right? It's being a family. And this idea of suddenly we're just going to be mega church is not really a very good idea for us, right? And if at any point in our life as a church we need to build a 5,000-seat auditorium for whatever reason, we better find a really good way to do what? To be a 5,000-attending family, right? And these things matter so much in who we are. So one of the things we often say is we don't have or earn the right to limit the kingdom of God. So to say, well, we're just a small church, that's not how it works. But to in some way try to compare ourselves to something different. To say, oh, now we're this. We're probably not. And if we try to do that, it probably won't work, by the way, because we aren't those people. The idea of who you are will stay the same, even as your way of looking at things, even as your way of operating as a church will probably have to shift because times change. And so one of the things that's a big kind of uh, idea for us that we look at and that we're going to spend our time doing is refocusing. Refocusing, remembering who we are. Remembering what it means to be family. Remembering that, you know what, if somebody comes in and doesn't feel like they had a place at the table, then we weren't Midland that Sunday. Because there's always another seat at the table when you come to Midland. There's always a place for you to join us. 
And anytime there's not, we have failed to be who we are, and probably because we tried to do something that we're not. And so this is a big part, refocus. And that's why we retell our story. That's why I show you this video from seven years ago. I want you to hear some of the story. You know what I want you to do? I want you to tell your story. If you grew up around here, I want you to tell some of your stories of what it meant growing up around here. If you've been here for the past few years, you're like, I remember when we had folding chairs out there. That's right. Then things moved real easily. By the end of the service, people would be scattered all over the place. Them chairs just shifting, you know? You tell your story. Because... A catalyst to being a healthy congregation and to having a chance to refocus on who we are, to grow into what God, who God has called us to be, is pausing to retell the stories. It's taking a break and just sitting around and talking and retelling our favorite times. But you know, there's something about storytelling that I think really matters. When it comes to storytelling, you, you heard most of just the good stuff, except for that part about, you know, Arch Brown, who's, you know, getting on to the folks when they weren't given enough money. We haven't had training for that recently on how to speak to our folks that you pass the plates, but we might if we need to, you know. But you retell these stories. You also tell the embarrassing moments, right? And you recount the times, not just when everything was amazing, but you recount the hard times. And you remember that time when we were trying to figure out how, in the midst of the conversation, literally the fight breaks out and that family never came back? How do we make sure that that's not the conversation we have again, Right? We don't just tell the best of the stories, we also tell the tough times. We also talk about uh, what we like to call the elephants in the room, right? The ones that are there, but we don't want to talk about. And we know, well, I mean, look at our world today. What are the two things in church that are a really big deal because they're a really big deal everywhere out there? Race and sexuality, right? And you want to talk about stuff that divides us, a stance on that? You know, so what we'd rather, I should not talk about it, I should try to ignore it. The fact, though, is that the way it's being talked about out there in the culture all around us is shaping our minds and every word you hear when you show up on Sunday morning. Did you know that? And you now are putting certain thoughts with something that wasn't in your head before now, but you can't hear something read from the Bible without going, okay, now how does that line up with this idea of the racism we're experiencing in different places and sexuality? You can't do it because it's in your head because you know what? The culture all around us has put it there. And if we don't address these things as a congregation, own up to the elephants in the room, then we stand a chance of burying ourselves in a pile of, what's the church word? Poop. That's right. Very good. That's right. Pile of poop. That's it. Israel Galindo is a great, uh, great professor as we close up this morning. And uh, he is at school I had a chance to go to for a few years when I was doing some extra work. And Israel Galindo, and uh, he had written a book talking about the the life and the cultures and congregation. He had a great quote. He said this. He said, uh, who we were is a big part of who we are. Who we were is a big part of who we are. A congregation that forgets its history loses its identity. And that's why we retell our story. You see, our story provides this foundation for us to build on as a congregation. These stories that we tell of back in the day when the trailer was out here, I was joking around with y'all earlier when Taylor redid the wall out here and she took away my third base. Right, I can also tell you the story when they took away second base when they built this building, right? A foundation to build on. And a story provides a lens to look into the future as we tell our story. And one of the other parts is it's not just this idea of what the story provides itself, but it's also the way we tell the story. Because see, the way that we tell the story reveals our culture. And when we're not willing to be honest about stuff, it reveals our culture. We don't want to own up to the fact that we don't always get it right. Oh, no, no, no. Here at Midland, we don't do stuff like that. No, no, no. Our culture says, you know, we've messed up before. And we've seen families come and then leave and go, that is not the church to go to. Why? Because we didn't get it right on a Sunday, did we? And we've had families come and go, this is the best place I've ever been. And we love that. And that's when we know we got something right. And we tell the stories because the way we tell our stories reveals the culture of our church here at Midland, the world we have created to live in. So I put the question before you to close up with worship this morning. Who are we? Who are we at Midland? As you look around, you got to hear in the video, that's one of the questions we ask them. Tell us about Midland. Who is Midland and why are you here? And what did you hear over and over again with those people? It was like a family. We came that first Sunday, right? I love the Richburg story. We came in there. You know, it, it was a food. It was, it was, you know, after, after service is going to be lunch, you know. And they invited us to come. We ate food, you know, like, it's like a family, right? 
This is why we identify ourselves here as a healthy family with another seat at the table. There's always that empty seat for someone to join us. And what we work towards is to make sure that's a seat for anybody to join us. That that's an open seat for anyone who's looking for a place to know they have a place at the table here at Midland. So, as we close it up, as a healthy family with another seat at the table, what story are we writing? As a healthy family with another seat at the table, what story are we writing? You look around at what we're doing now and what a Sunday looks like and what a Saturday looks like on either side of the road this past weekend. What story are we writing here at Midland? Let's pray. God, we read the great stories of Jesus Christ with us and living life, teaching, walking alongside a group of ordinary folks, going to the towns that some wanted to be in and others didn't, to the stories that have come since then, God, of lives being changed, of wars breaking out, of hope being restored, of acts done in violence, and the amazing moments of peace that we did not ever think was possible, but you made possible. And God, in the mixture of all that life brings us and the stories that we have to tell, God, may the narrative of your work in your creation always be the guiding path for us. And God, as we live life together here at Midland and as we look to all that is to come, God, may we move in your name and in your plans. God, not from Midland United Methodist Church, but for your kingdom to come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to close in worship. I'm going to invite you to your feet as we close.
So if you haven't had a chance and you want to, there's probably still some coffee back there, but there's some really cool pictures. If you just want to see the church through the years and take a look on the back tables, just some really cool stuff just to see if you want to hear a little bit more from the story of Midland. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and communion in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.